Midwest Travelogue is a production of Nassif, Elwood, and Day in partnership with Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. Support for Midwest Travelogue is provided by the Minnesota Office of Tourism. The Minnesota Office of Tourism encourages you to take a trip on a tank full. See the many ways you can explore Minnesota at exploreminnesota.com. Support is also provided by the Greater Minneapolis Convention and Visitors Association. For all of your visitor information, call 1-800-445-7412 or log on to minneapolis.org. Welcome to Midwest Travelog. I'm Carolyn Marinin. And I'm Joe Thornton. Every month we will take you around the Upper Midwest to explore some of the hidden treasures of the area and also some of the better known tourist attractions, places that you may want to explore with your family. You know, Joe, there are so many places around the metro area, around the Midwest, one day getaways that are places you'd never think about going. We're going to show you some of those places. One of those is the St. Paul Gangster Tour. St. Paul has this kind of dark, sordid history dating back to the 1920s, the gangster era. And there's a wonderful tour that shows kind of what the city was like back in that time. On a lighter note, I'm going to go roaming for snowmen. That's all I'm going to say. That sounds like fun. And we will go snowboarding down at Buck Hill with the kids. They are great at this sport, and we're going to show that from a kid's perspective. And speaking of winter, we are going to show you a lot about winter, things you can do, things you can learn, and you won't even get cold doing it. And one other stop on this, uh, this month's journey is to the St. Paul Curling Club. The sport of curling dates back to about the 1400s, and in Minnesota and St. Paul have kind of become the hub of this nationwide, and we're going to show you how you can enjoy the great sport of curling. Things we're going to learn here. Well, we better get cracking. All right, we'll see you later on. See you later. Um, it's, yeah, big kids play doh. Oh, I hope I get this done. Imagination is a wonderful thing. This one uh, is he's a he's a tourist, a visitor to Minnesota, especially in the middle of a Minnesota winter. So he's got his backpack and his fanny pack and his camera, of course, and uh, he's dressed for the winter weather here. And who better than an artist to create a little magic? I love anything that sparkles, so I really love glitter, glass. It's, uh, you know, it's mesmerizing. We're gonna kinda do some colors that are the new styles on the hat and the scarf, and he's gonna have a little jacket on with a pocket with the airline tickets in it, because he just came in town. Thinking maybe on the, maybe I won't put it on the babies, but maybe I'll do it on the snowman. Their canvas, a five and a half foot tall, 200 pound, bare naked snowmen. That's men as in Minnesota. The snowmen were designed by Tivoli 2, the same company that produced the now famous Peanuts characters all over St. Paul. So a group got together and thought, why not do the same thing, but only in the middle of winter? I mean, this is Minnesota, and what says winter more than a snowman? Yeah, I think what's so wonderful about this snowman project and actually this whole concept of putting these um, figures out and painting them and decorating them different ways um, is that it really stimulates, I think, creativity um, and interest amongst the general public. There really is such a spirit, I think, amongst the people that are involved. All the businesses and organizations that sponsor these, that allow this um, event to happen, really put so much goodwill into um, the community. 
And if you go Roman, you'll find some snowmen like this guy right here in Burnsville. But there are a total of 50 of these colorful creations all around the Twin Cities and the state. Wow. Nice. Talent and lots of tender, loving care have brought these snowmen to, well, almost to life. We're trying to decide whether it would whether it would go down at the base here, or possibly uh, up, up on the top here. Well, I kind of like it on the head. Remember, imagination is everything. What would we do if we had a snowman, and how would we decorate it? And, and you can do so many things, and, and I think um, people really love what they look like. It brings smiles to their faces, and it, it makes them curious about how are they made, and, and how, how are they put together, and, and what do the artists do to, to make that look that way. And so it, it becomes a very fun and interesting and, and exciting thing for people to see. Well, they call me the Glitter Fairy. You hope that you know people like your art when you're done. So I just want them to it to put a smile on their face. Lots of oohs and ahs when the crowd saw the snowman in the holodazzle. But if you miss the parade, you can still go Roman for these snowmen all through March. That's when these jolly fellows will be auctioned off and the money will go to local charity. Another reason to smile in the middle of a Minnesota winter. And now we're going to go a little bit underground. Chad Jackson tells us about one tour that takes us back in time. I'm Chad Jackson, and it's time for a St. Paul Gangster Tour. John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, Ma Barker and her boys, all gangsters and at one time all St. Paul residents. In the 1930s, St. Paul was home to some very famous and nefarious residents. Now you can trace their journeys in and around this great city from homes where some of the most notorious crimes ever perpetrated in the Upper Midwest were planned, to the many famous nightclubs where gangsters spent time socializing with the public. The St. Paul Gangster Tour has it all. The 1930s were a raucous time in St. Paul. The gangster days would come to an end with the new police regime and the Great Depression. But the sights live on. It all begins right here at the Castle Royal. The Castle Royal played host to such performers as Cab Calloway, Harry James, and the Dorsey Brothers in the front rooms, with illicit gambling going on in the back rooms. Well, thanks a lot, Chad, for that interesting piece of St. Paul history. We're going to switch gears now and talk about the ancient sport of curling. Now, this game dates back centuries, and thousands of people enjoy it every year across the Upper Midwest. But many more people don't know much about it. And this is a game that has something to offer to just about anybody. Young or old, guy or gal, the sport of curling is quietly but quickly gaining popularity. The greatest thing about the sport is the people. I mean, it's a great sport to play. You can start at a very young age. At six to ten years old, you start. And we have people in this club that are 78 years old that play in two leagues a week. The proficiency isn't, you know, like these girls. These girls are good. I could teach you how to curl and introduce you to a game right now. And you could play a game. You'll make some shots. You'll have fun at it. Margie Smith has been curling for 22 years. Like most curlers, she loves the strategy, skill, and finesse of this sport. A lot of people say it's a wimpy sport. You just go out there and throw a rock and you stand around and it's cold and everything, but it's really not. You can get a really good workout. Lurking just beneath the surface, the competitor in Margie comes out. She practices regularly with teammates Kelly Seeger and Cindy Johnson. These women are ready to take on any challenger, regardless of gender. The nice thing about playing as a woman, other than maybe a little bit with the upper body strength, sweeping against the men's teams, keeping up with them, as far as the accuracy and the balance and everything like that, women can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the guys. A full curling team is made up of four individuals, one who delivers the stone. 
then there are two sweepers. It's their job to control the length of the throw by actually warming the ice ever so slightly. This game is all about inches. The sweepers are in constant communication with each other and with the fourth team member, the skip. The skip sets the strategy, calling the shot to put the stone in the best possible place or to move the stone of the opposing team. The game always ends with a friendly handshake, then more often than not, a refreshment with teammates and opposing team members to reminisce about the game or to watch Canadian curling on satellite, keeping up with a sport that is king to our north. It's, it's an easy game to televise, it should be on TV. You know, and if we get TV exposure like you do on some of the other minor sports, I mean, if you can watch a motorcycle jump off a hill, I think you'd rather watch curling in my mind, right? <laughs> if you're looking for a change of pace in your winter routine, join the spectators at any curling club in the upper Midwest. Curlers are more than happy to tell you about their favorite sport. There's quite a bit of, of strategy involved um, in the game, a lot like chess. Um, there's blockers that you have to account for in every shot. It's really you know, a combination of a, of a lot of different games. Uh, pool, chess, uh, there's even some golf mechanics that, that you can apply to curling. John Benton has been curling since he was six years old. He says being involved with this sport is a great way to meet people. In his case, that's a huge understatement. I met him because I'm a curling groupie. I followed curling up in Hibbing with my dad, and I missed watching it. Came down to the St. Paul Club one day and met my husband. John's wife, Carrie Benton, sits behind the glass with all of the other spectators at curling tournaments throughout the season. She serves as the official scorekeeper. Curling is in her blood. My father curled, um, many of his friends curled, my friend's father's curled, so um, yeah, it, it's, it was a natural progression that <laughs> I ended up in a, um, in a curling family. It's easy to get started, and curlers say don't be intimidated or shy about it. Winters here are long, and this is a great getaway during your week or on the weekend. St. Paul has been home to some of the greats of science, entertainment, and literature, not the least of which would be F. Scott Fitzgerald. As one of the most noted authors of the 20th century, Fitzgerald lived all over the world. But he was born in St. Paul, and he lived here along historic Summit Avenue. During the summer of 1919, things weren't going so well for Fitzgerald. His novel, This Side of Paradise, was rejected by a publisher. He lost his job, and his fiancée left him because she thought he had no future. So F. Scott Fitzgerald returned to his parents' home on Summit Avenue, where he rewrote This Side of Paradise. This time it was published and became a classic. F. Scott Fitzgerald's life began to come together. He ultimately met and married Zelda Sayer. They had a child, Francis Scott, who they called Scotty. The family continued to travel the world over, but returned often to St. Paul. They lived in the Delwood and White Bear area, where they became fixtures on the social scene. Fitzgerald penned many more classics during his time here, adding to his legendary status with each work. St. Paul honors Fitzgerald in many ways. The Fitzgerald Theater, located in downtown St. Paul, bears his name. And just a few blocks over here in Rice Park in downtown St. Paul, you'll find this statue of Fitzgerald that shows him in his prime. And now let's go to Carolyn, who's got some indoor fun for your family this winter. The Minnesota Children's Museum in St. Paul has a winter wonderland waiting for you. Come inside and experience the fun of winter without the cold or the snow. It's full of colors and full of twinkling stars, and it's really kind of a wintry, snowy night in Minnesota. Oh, oh, that was nice. We really try to set the stage, and then we step back and let the adults and the kids play together. This is your first stop, and it's sure to put you in the right frame of mind, whatever your age. <laughs> 
You land right outside the snowball gallery and are you in for a wintry treat without the hats or the mittens. Because it's not that cold. The Ice Palace beckons kids, oh, and a few adults, almost immediately. So what are you doing? Making an ice cream. Oh, can I help you? Here you get to try your hand at building your very own ice palace. And these blocks are a little more manageable and nothing melts inside here. I've seen everything built from big thrones to couches to wonderful ice palace walls, so it's a lot of fun in here. And when this stuff falls, it doesn't hurt anyone. Doesn't hurt anyone. And maybe the most fun part about building a palace. Do we knock it down? Yeah! yeah. There we go. That's where the real fun comes, huh? When kids walk into the palace, into this room, they grin from ear to ear. Fun is a major objective, but so is learning. From teaching size and shape recognition. I'm tracing the, these snowflakes. To role playing in the warming house. Wait to mommy. To using your large motor skills. Wow. To do a little ice fishing or at the snowball toss. Yay, Katerina! Across town at the Science Museum of Minnesota, there are 300 artifacts from around the world assembled for a stunning exhibit. It's big in scale. It's 10,000 square feet. The Science Museum, we actually had to take a wall down to create enough space to house this exhibit. It's the biggest thing that we've done since we opened this building in 1999. It's called Vikings, the North Atlantic Saga, and it sheds light on the westward expansion of a group of people known as conquerors, adventurers, and master sailors. This is a fantastic exhibit. It's great for kids and adults of all ages. Particularly, I think folks in Minnesota will enjoy this because of the Scandinavian heritage around here. A lifestyle from a thousand years ago is beautifully displayed over 10,000 square feet. With Nordic roots running deep here in the Midwest, for some, it's a glimpse into their heritage. Right now, we're looking at the Gokstad ship, and this is a 1 6 scale model of an actual ship that the Vikings would have used. And ships were really, really significant to the Vikings. It's really the reason that they were able to be successful when they went a Viking, because the way that the ships were constructed, they could carry a lot of loot, they could carry a lot of men, they could um, fight off anyone who might try to attack them. But even if you have no Viking relatives, to be in the room with such pieces, with such history, is nothing short of amazing. Tell me about this piece right here. Right here we're looking at Ronvig's casket, and it is the most famous piece of Viking loot. It's very interesting. It was stolen from a Scottish monastery and given to a Norwegian woman. She inscribed her name on the bottom. It says Ronvig owns this casket. This exhibit takes great care to show you who the Vikings were and who they weren't. And there's many things that are misconceptions about the Vikings. One of the most common ones is the helmets with horns. So the exhibit starts and walks you through some of the common misperceptions and then leads you right into the way that they were with the weaponry and the shipbuilding and their farmers and their tradesmen and their artisans and all the wonderful things that they brought to the culture as well. This After you take in the exhibit, you can experience their lifestyle in the Viking village. I'm going to dress the edge just a little bit, push some of that back down, and then set the silver in. Here you get to be a little more hands-on. This is a pal-saw sheath, and you can feel it. Can you touch it? It's nice and warm. The interesting thing about this sheath is you didn't shear it certain times during the year it would shed. And then you could just pluck the wool off or comb the wool off, and that's how you would get their, get their wool. You can climb aboard a Viking ship, listen to some old stories. The first indication of, of the uh, bow lathe was about 300 BC, and it was a strap lathe. There would be an assistant that would be sitting over to the side pulling a strap back and forth. Try on their clothing, see how they made things and make some yourself. Oh. And, and just pretend you're a Viking for the day. It's really great for families. It's great for people of all ages to come on down and check it out. Truly a wonderful exhibit. St. Paul will be the last North American stop for the Vikings, so don't miss it.
ski areas across the upper Midwest could really be called snowboard areas these days. This is a sport that's growing in popularity, especially among younger kids, like my buddy Dominic who's coming in here. Dominic's going to tell us all about snowboarding. Why do you like this sport so much? Well, because it's not as tame as skiing. You can be a lot more wild. Your board isn't even as heavy as one ski. See, the thing is, and you can, like, turn better. You can do back flips better. You can do front flips better. You can do every trick probably better on a snowboard than you could on ski. Okay, if you say it's so easy, you show us. You go out there and be as wild as you can, Dominic. Okay. Show us all about snowboarding. How tough can this be? I've skied my whole life. He's nine. I can do this. I can do it. If your left foot is forward, you're a regular snowboarder. If you're goofy, you ride with your right foot forward. Well, I'm regular. I'm sure I'm regular. Gotta be. 360 air. Air to fakie. Hmm. I'll try that. Okay, Dominic, I was watching you, pal. That doesn't look that tough. I rented the snowboard, I rented the boots. Now, can you teach an old duffer like me how to do this? No, he's like you. You don't think so? No. You don't think so? No. I think you can. Let's go do it right now. How does this thing work? All uh, right. You pull it here. You put your foot in the front pocket like that. and then you step down really hard. Ah, I got it. Ah, uh, this is gonna be something. Try to keep up with me, Dominic. You gotta keep just, up just with try me. Try to keep up with me. Let's just say, for argument's sake, I can't do this. Yeah. How do we get back down the hill? What you have to do is take your board off and walk down. And look, see, there's a jump back here that you have a to jump. go. That's what I want. A jump. Yep. How big is the jump? I'll sit and I'll watch you. Well, that looks easy. Hey, Dominic, is there a bunny hill? OK, I'll give it a go. I'm too old for this. All right. Well, that's about 10 feet down the hill. Right up on that wall and go down. I don't think so. Like this, so here, I'll show you. You show me, and I'll say, wow, he's good. Well, Dominic, I uh, made it down the hill. Barely. <laughs> and I owe it all to you. Hey, if you want to be a kid correspondent at our show, you can check out our website, midwesttravelog.com. I'm going inside to warm up, and Dominic, you show us more how this is done. OK. our quirks when traveling, my mother walks into a hotel room and the first thing she does is look under the bed. Bad idea. Kind of like sending a hotel bedspread out for microscopic analysis. You just don't want to know. My quirk, hotel towels. Most times they're rough as steel wool and just about as transparent. Now I get it, hotel towels are washed every day. With that kind of a beating, these things don't last very long. But that's not my problem, or at least it shouldn't be. Think about it. How much do hotels pay for towels? A buck or two? And what do we pay for the room? I can't tell you how many $200 a night palaces I've stayed in with lousy towels. And while I'm on the subject, how about a towel that's big enough to be securely wrapped around an average size guy? You know the housekeeper's gonna knock on the door when you're getting out of the shower. Isn't their job tough enough? So fix the towels. The long-suffering travelers of the world will thank you. My mother would as well, but she's under the bed. Somebody better call housekeeping. Well, thanks for joining us today at Midwest Travel Log. We certainly hope you had a great time. And if you want to find out more information about some of the places we've been to, or you have some ideas yourself about where to go, you can join us online at MidwestTravelLog.com. 
or you can give us a call at 651-290-0716. Give us your story ideas, and we'd love to hear from you. Now, Carolyn, next month, what do we have in store? Well, you know, next month is February, February. Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. romance. Romance. See, connecting the dots, I'm I think. Connecting the dots. We're going to have a little bit of a romantic getaway, I think. That so. sounds marvelous. We hope you can join us next month for Midwest Travelogue. Have a great day. See you then. Midwest Travelogue is a production of Nassif, Elwood & Day in partnership with Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. Support for Midwest Travelogue is provided by the Minnesota Office of Tourism. The Minnesota Office of Tourism encourages you to take a trip on a tank full. See the many ways you can explore Minnesota at exploreminnesota.com. Support is also provided by the Greater Minneapolis Convention and Visitors Association. For all of your visitor information, call 1-800-445-7412 or log on to minneapolis.org.